When I finished Baraka with Ron many years ago, I had the feeling at that time, and you know, that was a long production, that was about three years, and we'd been to 24 countries, and you, you felt like it was a once-in-a-lifetime kind of experience, and you would never do something like that again. And it's taken uh, almost a couple of decades to put it together and do this again, and we actually stayed out longer this time. These are not projects you just, you know, fall off the truck and do. They take uh, a lot out of everyone that's in them. They're, they're extremely rewarding on many levels, but they're, uh, I'll say, twice in a lifetime kind of, kinds of projects. The sand painting mandala sequence we knew was going to open and close the film. We had that in the very beginning. And it was just, uh, Doc was a great place to go. Uh, because they were very supportive of us there to create the sand mandala. And I think they did that for us in two days. And then uh, we were able to film them uh, destroying it in another day. And we knew that that was a bookend of the film. And uh, we just had to go out for another um, year or two and fill in the, uh, <laughs> the gap. The core group was myself and Ron and um, Miles Connolly was the line producer, and J.C. Earl was the uh, first AC, and he really handled all the equipment or managed all the equipment. You know, when we did Barack, we had a permanent crew of five people, and you know, the biggest expense when you're making a movie like this is carrying a person around the world to 20-some countries, and you know, the, the hotels and the food and the travel. Yeah, you, know, you want to keep it to a minimum, and so we went down for some of the trips to four. It's definitely never dull when they're when they're traveling. Mark would say, okay, it might be quiet, but I think I was more busy while they were gone than I am when they're actually here, because when they're gone, it's always something that's changing. I would get a phone call that flight is changed. They're still going to the country, but they can't go right away, so now they're going to go to somewhere else. So now it's like, I have to scramble, I have to get in touch with our travel agents and make sure that all the flights have changed. And you know, that I think that was probably, as much as it would stressed me out slightly. I think I just, I, I loved it. On this job, we were really lucky to have a just very cohesive, solid team. We were in it and in it for such long extended periods of time and really suffering in some places that if there had been a weak link, we would have seen that right away. So I feel like, you know, between Mark and Ron and JC, myself, Alex too, uh, it was just the, the right chemistry for what we were trying to do. And I, I honestly can't imagine having done it with any other group of people. Everybody had to multitask. Everybody did a little bit of everything. And so it takes really a, a special kind of person to, to want to take that on uh, and disrupt their personal life in such a way where you're out on the road for so long. And everybody just was terrific. Everyone was wearing different hats. Uh, I was amazed the day that uh, I showed up and Mark Magison, our producer, had. Uh, carried like 80 pounds of batteries down from the, the top of a mountain. <laughs> it became pretty clear early on that uh, my experiences to date were just sort of the, the foundation for what we were getting into on Samsara. And I found not only that I was pushing my limits a lot, but I was really uh, surprising myself quite often with how much further we could take things, how much more we could achieve with what I would have said earlier had been you know, too small a crew and too much equipment. Typically, when you go off to an exotic location, you air freight the equipment as cargo. But the nature of how we set Samsar up was that we would go to a particular continent and then travel from one country to another. The air freight system would take too long, and so we began shipping everything or taking it with us as excess baggage. And we got pretty good at it. I feel like we probably were about as efficient as anybody could be with 70 plus cases. But it was always a, a, a moment, of, like a reality check, when we show up at the airport, start calling porters from every direction, rock up to the ticket counter and say, okay, we're here to check in. And they'd look at us and just the, the poor attendants, their eyes would roll. First of all, the camera without anything on it, without even a lens in a magazine, weighs 40 pounds. So we sort of went, most, most filmmaking's going towards like 5Ds and ultra lightweight and uh, we were holding to this camera that was designed 50 years ago, the basic movement, but it's still the best recording device there is. There's just no beating 65 millimeter film for quality, for resolution, for latitude. And so it was a real privilege for me to be on a project like this 
at this point in time and to be able to say, you know, we shot everything on film and, and not just film, but the highest quality film. But uh, it also comes with challenges. I mean, the, the film can't be x-rayed. And um, in this post 9-11 world, it's, it's hard to move film around, around the world. There may be another place to develop it in the world, but we, we weren't willing to accept any other place other than uh, Photocam. So we were always putting all the extra effort into getting the film into a country safely, getting it out of a country safely. And um, it's challenging because, you, you, you know, there's times when you're, you're, talking, you're talking it around an x-ray machine at an airport and they're like, sure, sure, no problem. And then they wheel it around the corner and you, you watch where they're going and they're heading straight to the x-ray machine. <laughs> it was a combination of the efforts of uh, Miles Connolly, our able line producer, and his shippers to make sure that that film got back to us. We would uh, process the film. We would then uh, go and do uh, a telecine uh, to evaluate what we had. Uh, sometimes that was with the guys in the field. Uh, most of the time it was after they came back. We work with local people in every country and that's really who we're relying on for getting us permits to film in the country, for getting us access to specific locations within a country, for you know translating for us, for uh, helping us with uh, production assistance and, and all those things that we need local help with to, um, to, to survive and, and make things work in, in all these different locations. Those are people that we develop really close working relationships even if we're there for a, you know, a short time. We were just super lucky to get hooked up with Noah Weinzweig in China. Noah is a producer and has a production company based in Beijing. He was just tremendous on this film and really got us access to a lot of locations that we were unable to access in other parts of the world. A lot, a lot of the food processing, for example, we, we were able to film in China. We weren't able to accomplish that anywhere else. Uh, there were so many people that did, did such a great job for us. I think having done Baraka, there was a bit of a legacy that helped us everywhere we went. I'm not working from my head. I'm working from a feeling uh, when we get to a location. That's what's really driving this cinematography. And it, life just tells you where to place that camera and how to shoot it. If you trust that inner feeling, you're, it's going to reveal something. But to do that, you can't, to me, I can't think about how to shoot a portrait or how to shoot a landscape. Or I have to get a, a feeling first about, is, are we in the right spot or the right time of day? <laughs> If you're going to do these time-lapse sequences, they've got to connect and move. And they can't just be about the time-lapse. It uh, has to be part of a bigger picture. And sequences like that need to be coming from the day, going into the night, coming out of the night, going back into the day as part of a cycle. The whole time-lapse aspect of it is really daunting. Uh, you go out and you turn the cameras on for six hours, eight hours, ten hours, and you come back praying to God that you've got something great and not really knowing until you get back home and see it for real. It was also just amazing to me that we could go out in the field for two or three months and come back with eight minutes of footage, ten minutes of footage. I mean, I shoot eight, ten minutes of footage before lunch on most of my projects. One of the things about time lapse is that what you're seeing isn't really what you're seeing. You know, when you're standing there watching the light shift across the treasury in Petra, it's a beautiful location, but it's pretty slow. Again, that's one of those scenarios where you have to trust that Ron and Mark really know what they're doing and that all that time and effort is going to pay off. The nature of time lapse is that it's this magic lens, it's this magic filter that shows you things that you could never see in real life. And so I think that um, early on, when we came back and started looking at dailies, I began to truly understand the potential of time-lapse photography and what it could show us about the world. In st really good still photography, you are looking at a portrait, but you're also getting a feeling from it. 
about who that person is. And with still photography, there's no words or dialogue. It's, it's an image. You get this epiphany from looking at it. So uh, that's the approach that uh, we're doing with these portraits. If they start talking, then your head's going to click in and you're going to say, well, where are they from? And a little bit about their background and it's going to come through. This way, you're more tuned into their inner essence. That's what we were trying to bring out. We definitely saw the full spectrum of life on this you know, human life on this planet from uh, the rural vi villages of Mali and Namibia all the way to La Scala in, in Milan. I mean, that's uh, one of the heights of what I would consider West Western civilization. Amazing to see humans doing their thing in that environment and humans doing their thing in the Rift Valley of uh, Ethiopia. It's such a liberating experience to suddenly realize that the world is your raw material for a movie. I've never been a part of that. But I also was fortunate to see the world through the eyes of Mark and Ron as well, and to see their inspiration and what got them excited. The world's a big, wonderful, beautiful place, and there are just amazing things. And, and uh, I'd like to go out and get them all and put them in a film. That's the idea, really. And you're not worried about if it's making sense or if you've got enough material. You're just being sort of guided when you do it. And uh, so it was much more relaxed in that sense because uh, we know that the process from doing the Baraka project that uh, it was easier, but harder in that the world is saying no. It's harder today in, in many ways to, to access locations than it was then. People are uh, much more concerned about how they're going to come across, whether you're in a factory situation or, or a personal portrait or whatever. Uh, you got a lot more questions. You need to explain the film concept in a lot more detail. So the, the kind of the barriers to entry are, are a lot higher uh, now than they were then. So we would do, I think in general, it seemed like four to six weeks and there were four to six weeks that were pretty, we were pretty much on. People talk about, oh, were you working five day weeks or six day weeks? We were, it was more like we were working six weeks, six weeks. <laughs> but it was great work and, and it, sometimes it was long days and, and tough turnarounds. But uh, the saving grace was that we were going for really high quality, not quantity. So we would, uh, you know, put the, put the energy into the getting, you know, the very best shots, not getting a thousand, a thousand mediocre shots. So, um, and when you're working for that kind of quality, you're, will, you're willing to, you know, do, do what it takes because you know that it's going to show up on the screen. When you do a film like this, you're, you're, you're setting it in, in, in stone and you just want it to be right. I think that's been an approach that we've had where we don't want regrets, you know, you don't want to think about what we might what it might have been or what that shot might have been or what that location might have been and so you give it everything you got to make it all happen and that's the process mm -hmm.